You are listening to the Caffeinated Thoughts Podcast. Hi, this is Shane Vanderhart. Welcome back to another episode. Sorry for the lengthy absence. Uh, this summer and spring has been busy, so uh, these obviously have not been weekly podcasts, but I'm uh, trying to uh, get them up as often as I can. And uh, today I wanted to offer a short episode. I had the opportunity to speak with Chase Holm, who's a candidate running uh, for mayor of Des Moines. Uh, he came on the podcast to discuss his views, uh, his background. Uh, he's got an interesting background, Army veteran who actually spent some time uh, being homeless. So uh, he's got some ideas that I think are intriguing. Uh, should he win the, the mayor, mayoral contest this fall? Uh, so I hope you tune into that. But before we get to that uh, interview, first a word from our sponsor, American Principles Project. At American Principles Project, we believe that human dignity should be at the heart of public policy. We work in all 50 states and in Washington, D.C. to promote life, religious freedom, local control over education, authentic economic progress for working Americans, and a return to constitutional principles such as federalism. Want to help American Principles Project? Visit our website today, AmericanPrinciplesProject.org. That's American Principles, P L E S, project.org. Sign up for email updates. Help us out. We want to work with you. That's American Principles Project.org. And we're back. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Chase Holm. Chase, welcome to the Caffeinate Thoughts Podcast. All right, thank you for having me. I appreciate it, Shane. Hey, very welcome. So, one question I always ask every candidate I speak to. Why do you want to run? Why do I want to run? Well, I mean, at first, you know, I came back from my second deployment, and uh, I think it was all slowly built up to this point. You know, I had a, a buddy, a Marine recon friend of mine, and him and I, we came back. We had some bad circumstances, and so we decided to live out in the woods for a few months, essentially homeless. And from there, we came up with a plan to benefit ourselves. And that plan was to reduce um, – expenditures, like to reduce things that didn't add benefit to our lives, to diversify our income, and then to concentrate on those things that truly benefited us. And with that plan, I, as I was trying to improve the city when I, once I moved here several years ago, I decided that that would be a perfect plan for our city. And that's what kind of got me moving along. And doing um, multiple conversations at the city council and seeing things not moving forward in the right direction that's that's really spurred me as well okay so uh, you, you said a couple things that just piqued my attention because i didn't really i don't know anything about your background uh tell, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about yourself where you're originally from how long you lived in des moines and i want to know about this you know being homeless for a while that that's interesting okay yeah so i grew up uh western iowa further out west that's okay. where i was that's where i originally came from uh but i've been everywhere with the military i've been in the military for over a decade I've deployed twice with them, so I've traveled to virtually every fort, uh, every base. I've worked with um, all sorts of different agencies overseas, and so that's, I've really been everywhere. I've been in this city uh, for several years now. I actually, my fiance, she's originally not even from here. She's from Zacatecas, Mexico, and her getting everything together, uh, running her business, being a property manager, that's what really got me to moving, moving ahead with my life and getting everything together. Uh, we have a daughter together. She's one, and she's pretty great. <laughs> that's that's another reason I want to see the city improve, not only for my own daughter, but for everyone's daughter. You know, I think if I'm assisting the city in a future forward momentum, then everybody's kids can grow with that. Um, that I mean, that's especially true with the the school systems. Our our uh, tax schemes that we that the city has employed has ruined our our school system. I think next year we're looking at twenty four million dollars shortfall. And firing 20 teachers so that's a devastation to the future um, generation and as far as the, yeah, the homeless thing we uh, we came back we wanted to build a nonprofit for veterans coming back and not having a direction and we were looking at a half million dollar property we wanted to build a recreation center housing uh, programs for work development station and the guy while we were over training soldiers in Wisconsin on weapon systems and on uh, caring for civilians on the battlefield that's one of the big things we do. He uh, sold it from out from under us. Didn't talk to us about it or anything. So I felt like 
you know, I, I still want to do the things that I, I can to help people, that selfless service that you're taught in the military. Yeah. Yeah. And this is just another direction. This is just another way to do that. Okay, Absolutely. So, so how long were you homeless and, and where were you homeless at? I mean, that, that just had to be three. Enough. Yeah, just three months. We we lived out in the woods, out in the the board area, pretty much camping, and that's that's the way we looked at it. Uh, but yeah, we didn't have a set place. I mean, I crashed with friends on occasion, but that was more just me trying to figure out where I wanted to go. I didn't want any set bills, any set place to live at the time, and neither did he. Uh, so we were like, hey, you know, what do we want? To, what's our next step? I, I think when every soldier comes back from overseas, it's almost like graduating from high school. You're uh, you're like, what do I do next? Uh, the, the world is my oyster, you know? And right. uh, I mean, I could have went anywhere. Yeah, he, he currently lives out in San Diego with the Marines. And mm-hmm. uh, I decided to stay here. This was where I uh, decided to set down roots. Was okay. in the yeah, I, I definitely. You know, the transition back home for a lot of soldiers and Marines and sailors are, you know, it's difficult. Um, mm-hmm. I, 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 your, your story resonates with me because my son, uh, he, he actually voluntarily became homeless for uh, like a summer and lived yeah. in his van. And we literally say he lived in a van down by the river. So, um, yeah. so it's, yeah, he, uh, and, and he, you know, he wanted to simplify. He wanted to, didn't want to have bills and things like that. And his mom and I had a hard time understanding that, but you know, it, he survived and he probably grown as a result of that. So absolutely. Uh, you know, yeah. yeah. Now I have to admit when, I think about a libertarian and city government. Uh, what comes to mind is Nick Offerman's ca- character, uh, Ron Swanson on Parks and Rec. Uh, mm-hmm. One of my favorite characters. So how how should you know how would how does libertarianism work in city government? Yeah, so absolutely. I I am more libertarian. I I think I've personally developed the concepts and the ideas for urban. For the urban environment on the libertarian idea, the more reduced government, uh, myself, and then with a bunch of my soldiers and friends, just discussing politics and how that would look. So I've come up with a lot of concepts myself. It's on my website, uh, home, H-O-L-M, homerunformayor.com, and it's a lot of detailed policies because I, I think what a lot of politicians have gotten away from is policies. They just do mm-hmm. a lot of pandering. You know, They say things that they know people like emotionally, and they don't develop policies that actually affect change uh, for the best. And so that's what I've looked at. Um, what that actually is, is allowing people more liberty to do what they want with their own money. That's, that's the concept that I've brought in, uh, forward. Um, I can tell you as far as property taxes, because the city has a spending problem and not a revenue problem, they'll tell you otherwise, because that's how they get to raise property taxes, as well as other right. taxes. But if you well, actually look at it, they don't actually raise. They don't actually raise property taxes. What they do is the Polk County Assessor, the assessor yeah. your home is is valued more. Uh, so that was, yep, you know, they that. don't. Yeah, that that yeah. tends well, to be a problem here. Yeah. Well, this last time they raised them, and they kept threatening to continue to raise them until they got that um, tax uh, right. through the sales. Yeah. So they were they were doing it then, and then they lowered the raise until everybody, hey, we lowered your property taxes. You're you're welcome. Um, but what I would like to do is rebate everybody. At least we'll start off with 5% of their property taxes. You know, if you we, – we do about 3000 so that would be 150 for us, you know, whatever anybody else has. But there, there's two avenues you can do with that. You can either, A, donate to a nonprofit, which there's a huge amount of them here. A lot of our land is actually nonprofits. Nonprofits, the philanthropic part of our city does a lot of great benefit. I actually worked with Project Iowa uh, as a volunteer on the board of directors for business. And we help underemployed, unemployed. We work with uh, the different homeless shelters trying to get them jobs. So there's mm-hmm. a great need for those nonprofits to continue to have people put money in there. And I, I think that's you know one of the great benefits of doing that is people could write that off on taxes, and it allows them to vote with their own wallets. And the second part, because I want more people to have more liberty to decide what they want to do with their own money, is if you can choose to put that into your own house. You can choose to put that money and build up your house. You know, that, that helps the city look better, your communities look better by improving the building that you live in. Okay. Sounds yeah, good. So, so, yeah. Uh, so as far as Des Moines having a spending problem, uh, where do you think reduction, spending reductions could take place? And, and what would you do as, you know, as, as mayor, if elected, 
to uh, help rein spending in. Obviously, you got to work with city council, uh, which mm -hmm. that's that's a feat in itself, just based on the makeup. So, how would you go about doing that? What would that look like? Absolutely. So, uh, one of the first things I would look at is uh, setting the example. I'd reduce my own pay. You know, I know in the paper it said I'm just going to reduce it willy nilly, like just out of the blue. But what I would like to do is tie the mayor's pay to the average income of families within the city. That actually reduces my pay by 10%, taking it from uh, 52000 to 48000 And then with that tie, wherever the city fluctuates, if the city's doing better, the families within the city are doing better, the mayor's pay would go up. If they're doing worse, it goes down. And that's a reflection on the job that the mayor's doing. So that would be the first thing I would do is just to tie that pay. Uh, after that, I would look at turning certain offices into nonprofits themselves. Since we're going to have people the liberty to spend their money the way they would want towards nonprofits, we can start turning certain industry, certain, I guess there would be committees that work within the city into nonprofits, and we'd have to assess that, obviously, as a whole. And then the third and most important is to uh, slowly, over time, get rid of the tax increment financing scheme that we still use here. It was developed in uh, 1952 in California, and it was abandoned by California because it gave them $10 billion in uh, debt. Here in the city, we have $432 million in debt, and about 15% of all of our money is spent on that debt every year. So it, it's really just a corporate welfare thing. I know the, the current mayor likes to spin it and make it seem like it's a really good thing, but mm -hmm. uh, it's always been used downtown. That compromises 5% of our population, and they get about 90% of that money. And, uh, right. it, yeah, it's terrible for the environment because it shifts jobs around. It doesn't actually create anything. And it, uh, it harms lower and middle income people the most because it, most of those people within that income bracket have a lot of their income tied into their property, into their house. And so it takes the most from them and gives to the wealthiest people, which is absolutely wrong. It's almost a reverse Robin Hood scheme. So, yeah, that'd be a big one. Okay. Um, so w what are some other issues that you're, you're running on? What are some other things you'd like to do if elected? Well, I'd like the, the city to stop harming individuals that don't harm anybody else. You know, if you are wanting to go to the range with whatever weapon system, you should be allowed to. We shouldn't, like the new uh, law coming up to ban magazines. The city council, I know they don't understand weapons because none of them have ever served in the military or as a first responder. And right. because of that, they don't understand that the magazine is an actual basic component of a weapon. It, it's not an accessory. It's, it's a basic component. It's what feeds the weapon. If you were to take out somebody's teeth and jaw, there would be a completely different person. It would completely change them. And that's the same thing with the weapon system. The magazine is the teeth and the jaw of a weapon system. And I mean, the only thing that that's going to do, be banned on magazines, it's just going to hurt the industries that supply those, those, those weapons right. that are above 10 rounds. It's going to hurt uh, law-abiding citizens because unlike what the city council said, they said that everybody who owns these magazines is out there to murder you. That's not true. If that were true, every right. veteran would be. You know, every cop, the, uh, every cop, the, the standard uh, weapon for 85% of police officers is the Glock 19 or the Glock 22, and that, that holds 15 rounds. Yeah. So I'm waiting, I'm waiting on to see where they're going with this, this limit on the Second Amendment, which obviously to enforce it, they have to uh, limit your Fourth Amendment right, the search and seizures. Right. So they're going to... They're going to hit two constitutional amendments. They're going to go against both of those. And, I mean, furthermore on that, they are already um, going against state law. It's, um, let's see. I was wondering about that. I, was, I, I wasn't sure if, if that was going to contradict current state law um, mm -hmm. or if whether state law gave, gave uh, municipalities flexibility, uh, wiggle room to, to uh, you know, uh, res restrict uh, different different aspects with uh, you know um, mag whether it's whether it's high capacity magazines or other you know other things with uh, with without necessarily uh, restricting somebody's right to carry. Yeah, so uh, it's state statute seven twenty four point twenty eight, and in that statute it states that the municipalities, the city council, uh, or the the counties, they can't supersede state law. And uh, as far as weaponry goes, and uh, because the magazine is a basic component and not an accessory to these weapons, mm -hmm. they're, they're unlawfully 
trying to enforce this. Now, like I said, on the 15th of July, they're going to try to bring up their, uh, I mean, essentially their pandering um, ordinance. Because I know the bump stock thing, too, they're trying to do that. And that's already a federal law. That's, that's insane right. that they're even bringing it up. That would be like this is running on a, a platform of trying to allow women to vote or abolishing slavery. You know, that's a federal thing already. It's, yeah. you know, so that's it's yeah. vastly unnecessary. It's a waste of taxpayers' money because they're wasting their it's time talking thing. about it. Yeah, virtue signaling to – Absolutely, to, uh, absolutely. Yep, the gun control lob or people. So. Yep. Um, okay, so uh, basically if they pass this, I mean they could just expect a lawsuit. Which oh, absolutely, yeah, which is going to hurt us again on the tax because they're not going to pay it. It's going to be the taxpayers that'll pay that lawsuit. Right. But I mean, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Hopefully, if they re if the state redrafts that, they either a don't allow people to run again when they go against state law when they're being unlawful or possibly incompetent because it's one of the two. They're either too incompetent to read that law or they're just criminals and they're uh, going against what the law says. There's really no way around that. Yeah. So we'll see which one it is. It, it, could, it could be a mystery, but so, I mean, we got that possibility as well. <laughs> it's, yeah, interesting. So one of the mm-hmm. things I, I, I've noticed uh, is that uh, conservatives and libertarians, well, uh, Republicans in general, as well as, you know, conservatives uh, and uh, probably even libertarians, I think we, so, we focus on federal races and we focus on state races. But I have to say, when it comes to municipal races, that I don't think we're as um, involved and engaged as, as I've seen some you know, liberal folks. Why do you think that is? And w- what can we do to change it? And, and I, have to, I have to guiltily raise my hand here because I know that's not, it's not an area of focus for me either, even though, you know, frankly, city government and county government impacts my life more than state government and federal government does, but that doesn't seem to be where most of my attention lies. Yeah, absolutely. I get what you're saying. And I, I think what I, I'm trailing, trying to extremely focus on is being nonpartisan. You know, I, I've talked to Democrats. I've talked to strong liberals. I've talked to conservatives, Republicans, libertarians. I've talked to everybody I could. And I, my ideas permeate all these people too because I'm right. focused on – helping the smallest minority within the city, the most neglected, which would be the individual. And that's what my policies are trying to touch on. I don't want to, when I do environmental, I don't want to hurt small businesses or businesses in general. Like that's all on the website, homerunforme.com. It's actually very detailed and it shows uh, the policies that don't actually harm people and assist the city as a whole. But I think uh, for your um, question, I know on the libertarian uh, side, why people don't elect them, uh, as a whole, I believe it's because you got people that don't – people that are more left-leaning, they want more government. you know. So mm-hmm. right. because they're running for government, they, they want more power. And if you're getting rid of government, like I'm, I'm proposing less government uh, oversight over you, you have to be willing to give up power. And if you're running in all these different elections and you're putting all this time and money into it, it's almost counterproductive – for a lot of people to give up a lot of that power. You know, a lot of those people have so much hubris that they're like, oh, I'm so much better than everybody else because I'm in this position, therefore I should decide everything. And that's, that's not how it should be. You're, you're there to assist people. You know, you shouldn't be there for the money. You shouldn't be there for the power. You shouldn't be there for right. any of it. You should try right. to reduce as much as possible. So well, I think that's, yeah. that's where it comes down to is there's, okay. that's the disconnect. Yeah, my my question is probably a little bit more broader than that. Is is mm-hmm. there's just I, I know it's a level of engagement. I'm not talking about who who votes for who, but it just seems like I know a lot of people on my that that lean towards my political uh, ideological perspective tends to be less engaged in in local races um, and and local politics, and we're focused more on state and federal politics. See what I'm saying? Yeah, um, no, I, I get where your question is yeah. going. Oh, I, I okay. Guess it didn't really have a lot to do with my where my position was, but I, I will answer that. I, I believe it's the ability to win. Uh, if you looked at the registered voters here in Des Moines, it's majority mm-hmm. Democrat, uh, then True. Republicans, and absolutely very any. Um, actually, uh, there's a lot, quite a few independents. That's where a lot of people can pick up. But it, it's the ability to win. A lot of people don't want to do anything if they can't win. That's what it is. They're, they're scared of trying. 
And if they see that an area is overwhelmingly one party, one part of the side, they're not going to run into it. So that, that's what it is. At the state level, um, virtually every state, each party has at least an equal um, ability to win. You know, there's a lot of purple states out there. There's a lot of strong red ones, and there's a lot of strong blue ones. And then there's also that power aspect, too. You know, on the municipal level, you don't have as much power because the state supersedes them and the federal supersedes them. So then you lose a lot of that, too. And I know a lot of these positions are all people that are, are love power for some reason. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, that's that's probably what it is. It's uh, that's why I just said, yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, how, how can people uh, get involved with your campaign? What, well, what you kind can, of help do you need? I, uh, I, I got quite a few volunteers. I would say donations. Uh, the biggest, biggest thing I want people to do is find out about what I'm what I'm talking about more in detail on the website home H O L M home run for mayor dot com. Start looking sure at those put, policies. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll put I'll put, make sure to put a link up on you know when I when the podcast is up for that as well. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and then the biggest 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 thing I'm trying to push November fifth, twenty nineteen vote. Whether you vote for me or you vote for one of the other two, just come out and vote. We I it's so anemic these local elections with people coming out. I think the last election, there was less than 8,000 people in a city of 220,000. That's, that's crazy, you know? Yeah. And the local I, government, even, go ahead. Well, I'm just wondering, you know, is part of the problem with having local races, you know, in an off year, you, know, you think it'd be better if, if it was tied in, the city elections were tied in with, with uh, state and federal elections as well? I mean, that, that probably would help. It's nice to kind of have our own thing. But I, I think one of the biggest things is the current city council and the current mayor have set voters that come out for them. And so they're almost a form of voter suppression is they don't tell people about it. There's no signs for it. It's not spread out everywhere. It's not even on the, the city council website, November 5th, 2019. They want their voters to come out, and that's it. So I think that would be one of the biggest problems for it is that they know they have a set standard of people. I mean, every year, the current mayor has about 6,000 people that vote for him, and that's, that's flatlined every single year. And so he has a set donor class, and he has a set voter class, and that's it. It's the people that he assists with schemes like the tax increment financing, where he shuffles money to his friends and family members for that. So I think that's probably the biggest problem with it. I don't think it would really matter too much. I mean, I, I don't see him doing it. Because because of that, they're able to suppress the vote through that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a shame. That's why I, everybody I talk to, I, all my cards, November 5th, 2019, that's the biggest thing I want people to take away is just to come out and vote. It would be fantastic if we can, you know, supersede 10,000 votes this year. That would be a great win for everyone. Yeah. Great. And since this is a Caffeinated Thoughts podcast, I thought I'd ask you a question I like asking us. You know, people I interview. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite coffee drink? What's my favorite? I, straight black. I, I don't like any sugar or any of that stuff. Uh, actually, that's what I have next to me right now. Just straight black right. coffee. Yeah. It, uh, it's good for you, and uh, it doesn't have all that additives. So, yeah. Awesome. awesome. All right. Well, hey, Chase, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, you, good luck, best of luck to you. And if you win, we'll definitely have you back on the talk about uh, your your uh, time as mayor. I appreciate it, Shane. And one thing I always like to, to take a, to kind of end stuff with is because mm -hmm. I, I am really pushing for that nonpartisanship, and I like people to know that it's not about, you know, being Democrat or Republican. I, I think on the local election, the elections, that's just a big distraction. Look left, look right. You know, which party do you belong to? On the local election, it doesn't matter. Uh, I know it matters strongly on the state and federal level, but when your your house is flooded, when the roads need construction, when the school system's out of money, it doesn't matter which which side you belong to, because they're distracted from you. Where you should be looking is up and down, up towards liberty, or down towards slavery, and that's what this election's going to be about. So All absolutely right. fantastic. Hey, thank you so much. Take care. All right, thank you, Shane. Bye. All right, you're welcome. Bye bye. And that concludes today's episode of the Caffeinated Thoughts Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you happen to be listening to this podcast somewhere other than our website, please be sure to check out caffeinatedthoughts.com. That's caffeinatedthoughts.com, C-A-F-F-E-I-N-A-T-E-D, 
caffeinatedthoughts.com. You could just Google caffeinated thoughts and we'll show up at the top of your screen. Also, be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, sign up for emails. That way you don't miss a single update. You can also subscribe to this podcast on on uh, Apple Podcasts. Please, uh, if you enjoy the podcast, give us a five-star rating. That would be much appreciated. You can also listen to us on Google Play, on Stitcher, on Spotify, on SoundCloud, on Podbean. Um, if there's a a podcast app that we are missing, you know, let me know. Shoot me an email at Shane at caffeinatedthoughts.com and I'll see what I can do to make sure uh, we're on that on that application as well. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great weekend. Uh, take care. This is Shane Van Hurt and take care, my friends. Mm-hmm.